good evening everyone uh, it's Andy here good to see you all uh, even if it is virtually uh, thanks for joining us this evening uh, we've got another uh, great talk for you uh, tonight uh, as part of our Dartmoor Heritage Festival uh, we're kicking off uh, with a talk about Chalicon Farm farming for nature in a historic landscape uh, and it's set it looks set to be a really interesting talk it's a fantastic uh, landscape over in that part of Dartmoor uh, with its uh, medieval strip lynchets uh, and its tin workings and, and all those other features of the landscape out that way. Uh, and we've got a fascinating talk uh, that Mark Owen is going to give us uh, shortly. Uh, those of you who are sh just still arriving, uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, as ever, uh, you can uh, chat to us through the course of the talk uh, by using the chat function, the live chat function. Um, if you don't want to sign in to do that, then you can email us at education at dartmoor.gov.uk and I'll be monitoring those emails as well through the course of the evening. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the way it runs, quite a simple sort of format. Uh, the talks usually last sort of 40 minutes to an hour or so, um, and then we usually sort of have time for about 30 minutes or so of questions at the end, so uh, we can have quite a lively debate at the end. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have got, as I say, uh, this is the first of four talks that we're doing as part of the Heritage Festival. So we're going to be looking at Dartmoor and the Black Death on Thursday night. Uh, the following Tuesday, uh, we're going to be looking at Dartmoor and the Defence of the Nation. And then on the following Thursday, we're going to be looking at History of Dartmoor in 10 Objects with uh, Andy Crabb, one of our Dartmoor archaeologists. So uh, a really uh, interesting packed uh, four talks all about Dartmoor's heritage uh, to come. Uh, we're going to kick off tonight, as I say, with uh, a look at Chalicum Farm. Uh, so we're really lucky uh, tonight we've got Mark Owen, uh, not Mark Owen of uh, Take That, but uh, another uh, really interesting uh, Mark. Uh, Mark uh, uh, manages uh, the uh, Chalicum Farm uh, with uh, his partner uh, Naomi Oakley, uh, and together they uh, run a really interesting uh, nature friendly farm out on Dartmoor and if you haven't been to it and walked through it uh, on the numerous footpaths and things then I recommend that you do at some point. Right that feels like that's enough uh, uh, chatter for me uh, in terms of sort of uh, making sure it's given people a little bit of time to uh, join us uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Mark uh, so, hi Mark, uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hi Andrew, and thanks everybody for turning up. Excellent. Um, so, can everybody see my slides? Uh, not, I not yet Mark, I've, I've still got you side by side with me, but I'll just hand you over okay. to the uh, to you alone. So, uh, uh, just for everyone else's uh, information, I'll be monitoring the emails and, uh, and the chat function, uh, so I won't be uh, chattering for a minute. So, uh, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just um, work out how to share my... So now you can see the title screen? Okay, brilliant. Okay, um, well, welcome everybody. Um, to give you a quick update or sort of quick introduction to what Chalicum Farm is, where it is, and then talk about how we farm um, which is in a historic landscape. So basic information about Chalicum Farm at the moment. Um, it's a part of the Duchy of Cornwall estate, so Prince Charles is our landlord. Um, the farm covers 320 hectares, of which 186 hectares of it is enclosed, the rest of it is part of the common. Um, and the altitude, we range from 1,000 to 1,350 feet, um, so a nice range of sort of habitats that go with that. And for those who don't know where we are, um, we're sort of just up from Widdicombe. Um, Grinspan is the top corner of our farm, Warrenhouse Inn on the Morton Hampstead Road, um, sort of post bridge, Haytor. So hopefully you can sort of work out where we are from the big red arrow, uh, point out where we are. Um, Andy mentioned um, we're the current tenants. Um, in fact, we've slipped a little bit there. 
I'm Mark Owen and my wife Naomi Oakley. Um, Naomi was brought up here on the farm. I sort of came in after meeting Naomi at college. My background is sort of countryside rangering right away. I went to the, the southwest coast path for 20 odd years. So farming isn't really my background. It's more about managing people and public access. And Naomi is principal specialist for natural England, um, particularly specialising in uplands and peat. Um, she also sits on the National Park Board and because she hasn't got quite enough to do, she's just started a PhD in regenerative agriculture and, and peat. Um, so that's us. Um, and a little bit about the farm. So this is a sort of overview map of the farm and talking about sort of it's a historic landscape. Like most of Dartmoor, it's been farmed for donkey's years. Um, you know, and the area in blue has been scheduled as an ancient, scheduled ancient monument. So that is the sort of highest level of protection, which limits um, what we can do. So any, any works we need to do on there in terms of agricultural operation, putting, even putting in a fence or a water pipe, anything like that, um, we would need to schedule monument consent. You know, fortunately, I've been working with a national park for years, um, and a crabby archaeologist, um, very pragmatic. Um, generally, before we want to do anything, Andy will come out and we'll discuss it and come up with something which you know works, protects the archaeology, and choose what we do. So I'm not going to go into a great deal of history of the farm in terms of the sort of man-made, also the how people have lived and worked on the farm thing, because I'm not an expert and I will probably get dates wrong. So just going to sort of some of the highlights of some of the archaeology on the farm. So we found this a couple of years back when our friends found it in the molehill. It's a, a flint scraper um, from the Neolithic period. So, you know, it's best part of probably 5,000 years old. So like Dartmoor, like most of the Dartmoor, you know, people have been wandering around on this landscape for, you know, thousands of years, each generation leaving its mark behind and the landscape has evolved. Um, so moving on to the Neolithic period, we then have the Bronze Age settlement. Um, many of you, no doubt, will have visited Grimm's Pound. Um, so this is a view of what it looks like today with a reconstruction of, you know, what it could, might have looked like in the past. Um, so this is the sort of Bronze Age settlers and typical to, you know, a lot of Dartmoor is, you know, people coming up here, possibly in the summer, you know, bring their animals up to graze before moving down. Um, they also started fresh bits of agriculture and um, the, 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 oh, you, hopefully you can see my arrows, but there's various reeves coming down the valley, which sort of coming downhill, which are, are sort of quite old. And then on the medieval period, people started ploughing across the landscape, um, to create these strip lynchets, sort of terraces. Uh, I think I'll oh, oh, another picture of terraces there. Um, um, so we've got these very old field patterns um, and the archaeological prescription for these is to try and keep the archaeology visible. So we do work and our animals help with this in terms of keeping scrub under control. Um, we do bracken control as well um, to try and make sure this, this landscape and these earthworks are not lost under beneath vegetation. Um, moving on, a bit later, we have a medieval village next to the farmhouse, um, dating from at least the fifth, uh, 16th century, uh, 1500s, and records that it's inhabited to at least 1880. Um, a series of between five and seven cottages in this little hamlet with the gardens going back up the hill. And Chalicum was farmed, it's certainly records of five farms that form the current Chalicum. Um, and 
again, look at the aerial view here, we have a medieval pound intersected by the road, um, used for um, keeping, la keeping um, animals in. And a little bit in the background there, sort of here, we have a much more recent addition, which is a pond we've created for wildlife, but also to stop sediment coming down and washing into the dart and also extending our rose pasture, which is a wet bogland, a sort of boggy area, which is very good to look marsh artillery, bog hoverflies, and other rare species. So we've been doing work to join these habitats together whilst avoiding anything archaeological. No. Um, again, this, this slide is slightly out of order. Um, this, these fields on the side of Hammerdown apparently some of the earliest dry stone walls on Dartmoor, which um, in the top corner here is a settlement. In the middle are a couple of hut circles, and there's probably remains of another settlement down here, as well as the strip lynch that's going across here, showing the ploughing. And what we've been doing in these fields, as well on the farm, is working with the National Park in Historic England to look at ways of controlling the bracken. Um, so this section here has been cut and you can see it's a lot more clear, i go back one, um, a bracken. And so over the next few years, we'll be doing much more of that sort of mechanical, trying to um, keep on top of a bracken. And the problem with bracken is the rhizomes, the roots, turn up the stratigraphy, um, the layers of the ecology um, and the ground. And also, just the, obs the obscure, particularly this time of year, with dense bracken, you cannot see the archaeology, so you can't enjoy it. Um, and from an animal welfare point of view, and for humans as well, it harbors ticks. So um, we do have an sort of ongoing uh, battle with, um, with um, bracken. And then on, this is looking the other side of the valley, um, and you, again, you've got these terraces all the way up the hill um, with overlay with, with some mining and it's a great time to come sort of late May is when these striplets and instruments look their best because they get covered in bluebells as part of the management we don't graze between Easter and middle of June because we enjoy the bluebells um, and so we just want to make them as good as possible. And then the other major thing, oh, so this is how the lynches were, were formed. Um, we're basically ploughing with oxen. Um, they would have been partly farmed communally so that between the sort of five hamlets, people would have shared the fields. They would have got some good fields, some poor fields, some close to the farm, some further away. Um, and then later on, we had the tin miners. So tin mining started at Chalicum in the sort of 1200s, out right up to 1930. This is um, just out the back of a farm by a sort of diner's house, but we've got battles down through the farm as well. Um, and just that sort of mining heritage and the cuts and the sort of the scars on the landscape, they've laid up over as well. Sort of, again, make a sort of fascinating place to explore. Um, this vote was taken from Tom Green's book called Home, which is a great book. If you're interested in tea mining, there's a sort of definitive one of showing how the old miners worked this landscape. And it's, you know, the whole thing about this landscape is, you know, generation upon generation of people have worked really hard to make that mark of a landscape in terms of the man hours of the amount of soil and material people have moved and, and lumps of granite to form the landscape as it is. It is absolutely amazing. It always astounds me. Um, and, and this map really sort of illustrates how the sort of historical richness of the farm. Um, basically, these are, you can see all these strips here. These are all the strip lynchets. We have tin mining through here with protecting pits and gullies. Um, we have the Bronze Age settlements here, hut circles, the very early field systems here, more strip lynchets, um, more settlements, more hut circles. 
um, and of course the medieval religion. This was done in the 1990 um, and really sort of set the scale, set the scene for how the farm has been farmed since. And I just sort of going to zoom in a bit on this photo to sort of show you the detail of how the concentration of archaeological features. And Chalcombe's is quite lucky. It was bought by the Duchy of Cornwall in 1917. And because we're quite a marginal farm, we're sort of high, high up here. And the Duchy, well, they're really good landlords. They don't like to spend a lot of money on their farms. And Chalcombe escaped from a lot of the improvements in inverted commas that were carried out you know, between the war right up to the 1970s, where you know, lynches were, were graded out, boundaries, all in the name of progress and improving, increasing productivity. Um, and Shalikam escaped virtually all of that. Um, it's just sort of one area sort of down here where shit lynches can get plowed out. But other than that, it's all pretty much intact. So that sort of gives you a very brief overview of some of the heritage of the farm. But alongside the heritage, we've also got a lot of wildlife. Um, these very old sort of habitats, wildlife has adapted to use them over the years and evolved um, specialism. So the green is the sort of women, um, um, uh, the Hammerdown Common is all triple SI for the Heather Moorland. And then all through our valley um, is wet Ross Pasture, Rose Pasture, um, which is county wildlife site. Um, and, you know, we're both sort of really interested in wildlife. And this is some just some of the wildlife on the farm. So from a red starts, cuckoos, marsh artilleries, the top is the, the bog hover fly, which feeds on the bog, bog bean. Uh, this is a kestrel. We have a friend who, who rings a lot of our birds. Um, actually, another kestrel, it's a barrowhawk. Um, um, I've constantly been doing it for about 10 years now, so we've got quite a good track. Uh, we've got a good, quite a good record of what birds are on, uh, on the thing. And up through the streams, we have otters, which is this one caught on our trail cam. And, you know, reason for this is we've got we've got a lovely range of habitats you know this is looking down in the valley and as well as the sort of wetlands we've got quite a lot of scrub and um, particularly in the spring and autumn we get a lot of migrant birds coming through um it's a north south valley following a river as well so a lot of stuff is is passing through and then stopping because we've got good food sources um and and habitat um, and then this is kind of some of the species you get down in the in the valley mires, the rose pasture, the heath spotted orchids, sun dunes, bog bean, and sort of more heath spotted, you know, hundreds of these. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a real delight and pleasure to see. And then we got some very good flower rich, species rich hay meadows. And on our ongoing management, we're now looking at sort of extending all our fields to become hay meadows or, you know, feature rich hay meadows. Um, so as well as the butterfly orchids, you've got the sort of more common yellow rattle, which sort of acts, suppresses the grasses. Uh, and, and this field is probably one of our favourites in terms of you just go there this time of year and it's just humming with insects. You get swallows wheeling above and it's just, you know, it's just a, a real joy and pleasure. The sort of sitting. Um, so it does get quite, and we probably spend more time focusing on this field than we do any of our other fields because, you know, in a few weeks' time we, we'll be, we've got, we've been bracken pulling and we get some volunteers out. And then in the winter, um, going around with a strimmer doing, um, cutting off all the gorse regrowth um, compared to our other sort of um, more productive grass fields, um, which tend to get sort of left because there's less things which are interesting in them, you know, so this is a great field. And then this is on the other side of a road on the house side where we've got the very ancient meadows on the strip lynchets because these haven't been ploughed, you know, 
certainly in modern times, um, wouldn't have had, they've ever had tractors up there. So um, who knows when the medieval sort of ploughing stopped. But because of the soil thing, we got an amazing variety of wax caps, um, sort of 13, 14 types, um, which makes it apparently a sort of regionally important site for wax caps. And again, they all add to the interest of the farm and you just get these amazing colours in the autumn. And then as you get on top of the hill, you get to the heather moorland, where you've got the bilberry and the various types of heather. And you know, they're just coming in the flower now. So again, that's a sort of real pleasure to be up there. Um, and you get great views up there. So in terms of managing it, we manage it with cattle and our animals um, to try and maintain all the different habitats and stuff. And on top of um, the sort of wildlife interest, we've also got lots of lots of public access. Um, so all the, the yellow sort of pale cream colour is all open access land. So just about all about apart from these little fields here. And then we've got uh, public right of ways coming through. Um, the track through the forest is just a, a public footpath because but because it's quite a nice wide track and it's ideal for mountain bikes and, and horse riders, we've upgraded it to a permissive bride away. And we've added another permissive bride away so we can come in off the road there. And then sort of routes off Hammer Down is the footpath coming down here from two barrows so that people can join the road. And this seems to be quite a popular walk now, it's in a few guidebooks. Is coming along the ridge of Hammerdown and dropping down into the valley to come and see the village before also continuing on through to Golden Dagger and a bit of the mines. So along like just the informal public access, we also have a sort of a lot of events. Um, we're always happy to do guided walks for any groups, you know, where it's looking at history, and this like group looking at the tin mining. This is one of the old um where they say it's old, this is sort of 1930s um, wheel pit thing. And then we have Ranger Ralph, this is um, uh, this is, yeah, in, uh, what is his name now? And uh, Bill, Bill, Bill Allen, yeah, Bill Allen, of course. Um, showing the young rangers and the, ranger, the ranger, young Ranger Ralph team um, smelting pewter as a sort of proxy for tin, making little in metals and implements, but just showing the process of getting ore and casting it. Um, and we, I say we have various open days, and um, we'll talk a bit about sheep later on. Um, but sort of some of the stuff people make out the fleeces, it's really nice to see what make, makes it. So we invite spinners and craftspeople back. Um, in the summer to sort of show some of their wares and some of the things that can be made from it and then open up our hay meadows and other things for various walks and talks. And we've also um, improved the routes through the farm. So where we had sort of odd bits of um, boggy bits or where the camber is a bit um, steep or narrow, we just sort of tweaked it so that rugged mobility scooters can get through the valley farm as, through the valley and see the farm. It's quite a nice big off-road section of path. You can see sort of real moorland. And at each of our entrances, we have um, welcome boards, which explain the, you know, the whole selection about the farming, the heritage, the wildlife of the farm. Um, we just sort of, we found them, you know, people like them, but also I think it encourages people to respect the farm as well and feel welcome and comfortable walking through it. Um, which we like. Um, so that's kind of overview of the farm. And this is kind of, if you overlay everything, you can see, you know, potentially there's an awful lot of restrictions on a farm. The white bits are basically the bits which haven't got any designations on um, or public access. And it's not a lot. It's, it's really just these few fields down the bottom here, which are our hay meadows. Um, which I say we, we do do walks through them in the summer um, and looking at converting those as well. Um, and a lot of farmers, I think, would see this as, you know, a bit of a challenge, you know, restriction, a pain. But for us, we see it as something that makes it, you know, far more interesting place that, to farm. I suppose, you know, with my rendering background, which we're in the people, then farm animals, 
Um, and so kind of almost manage it, you know, for nature, for people, for archaeology, um, rather than for production. And you know, fortunately, this has been going on a long time. And as I mentioned earlier, this, this 1990 map, and that was kind of a start of a change in farming at Chalakum. Um Because before Naomi and I took on the tenancy of the farm, it was farmed by uh, Naomi's mum, Min, Min Cullum. And, you know, I spoke to her and she would sort of bring out this map to all the visitors, you know, and made her pr proud of actually sort of, you know, how much history was on the farm, but it also was a light bulb moment for me in terms of realising this is why you couldn't make money on the farm in a conventional manner, um, because it was just so rich in other things. But you could do other things with a farm, you know, and how important it was, you know, particularly for the archaeology well, I, so on the back of this, she sat down with the National Park archaeologist, Debbie Griffiths at that time, and the ecologist, Sue Goodfellow, and the Dutch Cornwall land agent, and said, you know, farming, you know, how do we manage this as a farm? And between them, they came up with a basic management plan, the first of the sort of national park management plans is before countryside stewardship. And they split the farm into, I think, 15 blocks, and for each one did a prescription, but trying to get that balance within each block in terms of what was the priority. Was it wildlife and ecology? Was it the archaeology? Or was it a sort of, I wouldn't say a sacrificial plan, but was it areas where men could actually sort of focus more on production and the farming? Um, and on the back of that, there was a payment which sort of enabled men to sort of be financially viable as a farm, but still sort of farm more gently rather than trying to battle nature, battle the archaeology and make, you know, this trying to make this land productive, um, which, you know, in this landscape, you know, is a real challenge. You've got to end up spending a lot of money and effort and time and effort trying to, you know, make the land productive, you know, a phrase written um been sort of been saying about well, you know you can scratch the animal's back but it will scratch it, scratch your eyes out in return um because it is a very hard landscape to make a living out of and so this management agreement you know starting in 1995 was the start of sort of conservation management of the farm um which we are now sort of continuing on uh, min died four years ago and we've now taken on the tenancy and probably accelerated, you know, moved it even more towards the conservation aspect. So a key part of um, any farm is livestock. And here we need livestock to maintain the wildlife habitats and also the archaeology. So we keep cattle and sheep. Um, but for us, you know, alongside it, that is the welfare of the animals is is critical. That's our sort of almost first priority and ensure they have a rich lifestyle. Um, so they have everything they need. And also, you know, going into the sort of climate emergency is what we can do to reduce our carbon footprint or even ideally be carbon positive. Um, so for that reason, um, we are all our stock is 100% grass fed. And we also farm organically as well. Um, so that we're not buying in food. So we're minimising um, anything that's related to fossil food, food uh, fuels. So not buying in, in feed, which is being used using petrochemicals down the hill. Um, no artificial fertilisers bringing in. Um, and basically reducing our inputs and trying to be as self-sufficient as possible. Um, so we've ended up with, you know, a small herd of cattle. These are mostly Welsh black cattle, along with a few other um, older uh, cows, which we, we've brought in. They roam pretty freely most of the year. Um, there's a few matriarchs which lead the rest of the herd, and they move around the landscape very much depending on the weather. 
um, whether they, you know whether it's hot, they go on top of the hill. Whether there's a breeze and away from the flies, if the weather comes in rough, they come down into the valleys and then we run. Um, and then, and so this is kind of rough sort of winter landscape. You know? So this is them in the winter. In the winter, they're allowed out. Um, well, allowed all the time. In the, in the bottom left here, you can see our cattle barns, and they're fed in there, embedded in there. But during the day, they're able to go out. We put in a, a, a cattle track so that we don't have poaching on the entrance, so they get in and out while it being muddy. But if the weather is, is half reasonable, they much prefer to be out. And then they just come in at the sort of afternoon, evening to eat hay from our hay meadows. So along with our cattle, we have um, some sheep. Our sheep are Icelandic, or well, Shetland sheep, most of the ewes, with Icelandic rams. Um, we have about 150 ewes and 150 or so lambs at a time, between 100 and 150 at a time. Um, and these are nice sheep. They're a bit unusual for Dartmoor, um, which does mean that it's very easy for us to recognise which ones are ours. We don't graze the common, we keep everything on our in by land. But we like these sheep because they are hardy, you know, that, you know, as from their ancestors, you know, have come from much harsher climates. They also like eating gorse, which is a real bonus on the archaeology. Um, they're quite small sheep, they're slow growing. Um, so where most lamb is ready at about six months old, um, our lambs aren't ready to be eaten, well, the boys, anyway, until they're sort of 15, 18 months old. So we sell them as hoggett rather than lamb. Um, but they're quite happy to, I say, live out year round on just the vegetation we have. Oh, and their, and their fleeces are lovely as well. We mentioned about spinners and weavers use them. And when they're shorn, um, moment some of their some of their fleeces are used by um, weavers and crafters um, some that's gone off to Bella Couche, which is a lady in Morton Hampstead who makes felt coffins and shrouds out of it um, and other fleeces go to make vegetarian fleece sheepskins which is the whole um, fleece taken off in one piece and then felted onto a piece of cloth um, so in a much sought after because they are really soft and, and lovely and, and beautiful colours. Um, so it's, you know, it sort of really pleases us in terms of knowing where the wool and where the animals go to. And, and it goes to make something, you know, really pretty, which people, you know, makes people happy. Um, so this is the only time they come in is, is lambing. Um, we lamb generally in April. Um, so it's always a bit of back balance, a tight balance that time of year in being able to get our cattle out um, and, our, and our sheep in, in, in terms of what buildings we've got. Um, so we keep initially in a shed all together. Um, and then as they lamb, they go into pens. So they bond with their lambs and then they go out into a small field for a few days and then out into a larger field as a way of sort of keeping them safe from foxes and making sure they're bonded and we can keep an eye on them. But so we have a sort of hectic sort of April. And then final final sort of species we have, um, we have Dartmoor ponies. We have about a dozen on loan during the winter. We were, um, they do a really important job of grazing off the millennia of the purple moorgrass on the, on the sort of boggy areas and also on the high, high bits of moor, the heather moorland. Um, the word suppressing. So it's always a sort of balance in terms of getting the right numbers of animals at the right time. And then our final um, characters are we, each summer we have three or four pigs which roam over you know, a good 100 acres, if not more. Um, and they're here um, partly to give sausages and bacon, but also because in their rooting, it's spread over quite a big area they don't cause too much damage it's very localized but they create little sort of niche habitats in the same way wild boar would have done 
in this landscape sort of many years ago. Um, so, and this is a sort of just quick picture of them grazing sort of on our slopes here. So, um, mentioned a bit about sheepskins. Um, so these are the, some of the sheepskins from, from the meat uh, sheep. So we about sort of 30, 40 uh, lambs go off each, well, hoggets go off each year, which we then sell direct through our website and through um, Good Food Exeter. And where possible, we get the sheepskins um, tanned down in Buckfastley um, because they're, you know, they're beautiful and they're lovely sort of product, product to give people. Um, the meat, as I mentioned, being grass fed, it's it's much leaner than normal um, lamb and beef, and sort of high standard. And say we sell that direct. So, so that's kind of we sell mostly for our website, um, and sort of keep updates on people. So it's always happy. So let's get through that. So one thing, sort of, for a touch on tonight is is sort of looking ahead. You know, what does the future hold? Um, not only for us, but also for other Dartmoor farms. And so I'll bring up this graph because it's a it's a survey done last year um, by DEFRA, looking at the profitability of upland farms. And yeah, we're somewhere in this area of profitability. Yeah, basically, upland farms do not make money. Um, if I just zoom in on the bit on the upland farms is, you know, the average profit is, you know, in 1819 was 15 and a half thousand. In 1920, you know, it was a better year. It went up to 22,000. But if I just go back and remember what the, the colour goes, the yellow is at the top, is the money you get from your basic payment scheme. The, the grey is, any diversification, the orange is out any any payments farmers get from agri environment. So all the things they're all things that farmers make a profit on. What they don't make a profit on, certainly in the uplands, is their agricultural bit. That makes a loss of you know 15, 20,000 pounds a year. And it's only through the other things that we actually manage to make any profit at all. Um, and this yellow bit which forms the basic payment scheme is is being phased out by 2028. So, you know, we're, most of the farms are going to be in that sort of 30,000 up to 30,000 pounds. You know, this year they're losing 5% of that. Next year, losing 20%, you know, 50% 20, going out by 2028. Um, and without that, you know, their, their profitability is going to be down here. Um, fortunately, and as the government is saying, they're going to be investing all that money they're saving back into public money for public goods. Um, so all things which Dartmoor farms are very well placed to provide, um, much more than you know having growing beef and sheep. Um, you know all we is public goods. Public goods are defined as things which there's a there's a failure in things in terms of it's not um, covered in the price you pay for meat in terms of you know the clean and plentiful water. You know if farms create pollution, you know that is not costed into the factory. It pushes those costs down further down into the wider environment. Um, plants and wildlife, animal health. The culture and heritage is important to the more the access engagement and education and you know increasingly important the climate mitigating climate change you know dartmoor's got a lot of peat and you know and scopes for planting trees in the right places right trees in the right places so these are all things which as dartmoor farmers i think we are very well placed to deliver you know some farms will have to adapt and change their practices more than they are at the moment. Um, so we will see how that, that goes and, and shakes out and everything. And assuming the government keeps to its word in actually keeping the pot of money, you know, the same 
and, and basically I said what we're looking for is replay is keeping this yellow band um, a funding in place and the orange band but targeting it much more than it has been in the past is certainly the basic payment scheme has been paid on an area basis with not a lot of strings attached um, so my mind exactly this will provide better value for, for the public purse in asking farmers to deliver to much better targeted and farmers you know Dartmoor I think can adapt to deliver these things um, certainly we've been working with some of our neighbors um, you know we're in the post areas there's 10 of us farms who are now working together to come up with landscape scale proposals to manage our habitats better for wildlife. Um, this started three or four years ago now, um, part of the All the Moors Butterflies project. Um, and through that, they had project officers in place who met with us all, um, got us infused in our marsh artillery butterflies and the habitat um, they, they need to survive the rose pasture and the devil's a bit scabious plant and they've given us advice on how we manage those habitats better and we've all done things to improve our habitats you know this is without any payment um and we've enjoyed that we've, we've even uh, had a little sort of um bit of a competition between us about who can get the most marsh artilleries on our land um and we'll sort of get surveyed every year and it's just you know it's, it's really good and you know these farmers, you know, we all see the writing on the wall where things are going. And so what does make our farms more resilient for nature? Um, we can see by working together, we can actually get much better change. So we don't have hard boundaries between our farms, which nature doesn't recognise. The more we link together, the more resilient we make these things. And we're, let's say, developing all our, what's known as natural capital plans um, together. Um, to look at what we can do to, you know, restore some of these valuable habitats, which is sort of really exciting. Um, and um, launched a couple of weeks back is, is a new grant scheme called Farming and Protected Landscapes, which is running through 2024. And we've all got a list of improvements we can make. For us, it's going to be more trees and more wet areas um, and more bracken control and things for the, the landscape. Um, which aren't covered by our existing agreements. Um, so that's sort of quite exciting if that sort of all comes together and, and right away in access improvements as well. So that kind of almost sums up what we're going to see. Well, I would sort of encourage you all to sort of come and come and see us at some stage. Um, this is just a lovely view looking down on our farm from near Grimspound and um, the wall is our boundary. So you can see the sort of change, the difference that agri-environment funding and sort of management can make in terms of the landscape you can have delivered. So I just leave you on a slide with um, sort of having. So we do a monthly newsletter um, with sort of what's happening on the farm in terms of wildlife, any events we're running, talks like tonight, um, and also by um, meat and sheepskins from our website. Um, we post stuff when I remember on on Facebook and Instagram and a friend of ours did this lovely logo which kind of sums up where we are now uh, moving forward which is that combination of wildlife and the landscape and the pattern within the dragonfly's wings is the field pattern looking up the valley from the sort of strip lynchets to our meadows coming down these old Bronze Age fields. Um, so that's it. I think we're moving on to any questions. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, Mark, thank you very much for giving that talk a, a whistle, uh, a whistle stop tour of Chalicum Farm. Uh, really fascinating. And, and one of the things that really came out of it for me was how we uh, we want so much out of our land. Uh, you know, we want it to produce food. Uh, we want to be able to go and walk across it. We want to be able to see wildlife. We want it to be fantastic for heritage uh, and all that wonderful archaeology. And it's getting that balance, isn't it, really, of sort of like, of all those different things there. Because if you're going to be a productive farmer, 
then you know yeah you would be follow those those uh those earlier guidances of plowing things out and try to make it so you could get the bigger machines in and do all that kind of extra stuff that they do in the lowlands but we would have lost so much so yeah you can see why why all these schemes are really important to help support all this so so yes fantastic uh, we've got a couple of questions in so i will ask the question and then uh if you can then turn your microphone and we'll try and do it that way around so uh david uh has asked um a, a question about the sheep and your meadows you've got all these wonderful wildflower meadows um is it difficult sort of like keeping that balance of sort of keeping livestock off them so you don't end up sort of uh losing all those wonderful wildflowers um, that's actually quite straightforward because they are fenced off from the rest of the farm. Um, so the sheep only go on them after the end of the season. Um, so that's a real treat come August, the sort of week or so after they've been cut, is letting the cattle and the sheep in and so they sort of trim around the edges and they get really excited about sort of going in and just having a change of scenery, but also just a change of sort of um, selling something to eat. Um, so okay. yeah, it's it's always a bit of a balance certain times of year you're a bit short of fodder and you think oh we could just put them in those fields but sorry yeah so it's it's always a bit of a juggling act <laughs> thanks for that um okay well these seems to have got rid of the echo there so that's all working okay um uh yes that's that's really good uh nigel asks uh, how do you manage the bracken uh yes yeah, so i imagine this uh is we probably need somewhere between the short answer and the really long answer because i imagine there's probably quite a long answer to that as well okay um many years ago back in 1992 i think the bracken first got treated with azulam um, with helicopter spraying um with a very selective herbicide um, doesn't affect other non-target species. It's only firms. And helicopter pilots are absolutely amazing in terms of you can see our boundary wall, um, how they turned um, and sort of went and then came back the other way. Um, you really see the boundary. Um, it then got sprayed once more about 20 years ago. Now that we're organic, we are ruling out spraying. So I have a bracken roller behind my quad bike um which which crushes it so on on new areas we're now doing that and um looking um in the hay meadows we are pulling it by hand um and we've done sort of various trials and cutting is very effective where you get machinery in we are limited um and certainly on the steeper slopes I'm, I'm not willing to take a tractor up there. I'm too much of a wuss. Um, and in the old fields, um, they must have had really small tractors because the gate through is only about six foot. Um, so it's always a struggle, even with a quad bike. And I've got a bracken bruiser that goes behind the quad bike. Some of the gateways are even small, too small for that. So it's a really sort of wiggle to get through. So it's just an ongoing sort of give it a hard time. <laughs> yeah, there's no a simple answer as to dealing with bracken. It is just a... A, a really difficult one to deal with and especially now we're much more aware of of its uh its, its properties which aren't so nice for people uh, as well it's yeah. um uh, a couple of questions here uh, the morn family uh, have got in touch i don't know whether you you know them they've asked two questions have you has there been anyone filming on the farm recently uh, and the second part of that is uh, that they just want to pass on their thanks, uh, but they're also hoping to come down to help on the bracken pull on the 25th. So there's a little advert there for the uh, for your yeah. bracken pulling really day. Heggy. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yes, yes, we've had our filming recently. That's awesome. Um, we had a wildlife crew filming in um, for about a month, filming our swallows. Um, again, it's sort of it's part of our farm diversification. We're more than happy to have anybody. It's just yeah, it's a real celebration. We are so lucky to have the swallows here, and we've got you know amazing film crew here. The, the shots they took were absolutely stunning, and the amount of time and care they take to sort of get the perfect shots. And they had some amazing kit as well. They had seven different drones. Wow. <laughs> um, um, so and then emptying other cameras, 
So. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, we've all got amazing cameras and things in our pockets now on our phones and stuff, and we can take pretty good yeah. pictures. But yeah, there's a real art, isn't it? You can see why actually these people are skilled uh, and do all these amazing shots. Yeah, they are fantastic. Um, I've got a couple. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, this. Yeah, particularly the slow motion stuff they've done, sort of nine and sixty frames per second. Yeah. Of sort of you know swallows coming in, just seeing how these, how their wings and their feathers all sort of bend to get the control they have is absolutely amazing. So that won't be out until twenty twenty three because I think they've got a year now of editing, um, right. of it. So yeah. Excellent. Something just very strange just happens to your uh, your. Uh, picture then it just sort of went very narrow i thought we were going to lose you into sort of some kind of folded in kind of matrix world but yeah. then fortunately you came back out again so that's good um uh, david has just asked uh he's asked a question about um in the future you uh said you might develop some more wetland areas would you support the reintroduction of the wild beaver um yes sure um we the Issue with beavers at the moment is you've got to have a fenced compound um, to sort of keep them in, and that just is really practical and also really expensive. Um, government legislation is rumoured to change to make it a lot more easy, a lot easier to release beavers out in the wild, and hopefully, certainly with the willows we got, somebody will release them sometime in the dark catchment in the west webham catchment, and they will make our way up to us. Yeah. Um, if we, if we if we're not allowed to release any ourselves as well yes so. yeah it's it's a really yeah. interesting debate isn't it that because it's sort of it probably touches on the on that sort of that that wilding uh, debate that sort of that, that rages around and it's it's interesting because you know the the actual uh, special qualities of the national park are about the landscape we've got at the moment and this sort of this open moorland landscape and that's a landscape that's very much a working landscape isn't it of sort of of, of farmers yeah. and and grazing and all those sorts of things so it would if we did entertain the idea of wilding then it would have to change the landscape and that would that would be a massive sort of thing to sort of face what, what are your thoughts on on wilding and I, I think what rewilding has its place but i think sort of wilder dartmoor is a better way forward in terms of it's still got a role for farms and also i think nature is going to need a hand and where you've got specialist habitats and specialist species that require you know it has been a farmed landscape for thousands of years yeah you know, things like astrip lynch it says we're going to need animals but we can do things to to manage it and where you know areas you know we'd love to see you know more wissom's woods around and sort of more of the river valleys wooded up but it's always you know is making that balance between the wild landscape and the amazing historic landscape of Dartmoor in terms of how much it gets covered with trees, as well as, you know, say things like marsh artillery, you know, the Ross pasture, we left it to rewild, the willow would move in probably, and in time, which you'd lose your marsh artillery. So it's a case of that balance. Um, yes. So I think wilder rather than rewilding is the way forward and have that vision you know we probably do need more trees up in Dartmoor certainly in the in the river valleys but the open open tops you know keeping those clear would yeah. be you know good so it's yeah active active conservation rather than walking away yes um, and I think it's probably an easier sell with land landowners and farmers as well in saying you can do less but better you can still have your animals but you probably don't need as many but you can care for them better and they're sort of tools for managing the landscape. Yes. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear, 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 hear that as well, because yeah, it was, um, well, I could see that debate, the debate raging for, for, for a long time, but it's, it, as I say, it's a, it's a working landscape, isn't it? That we, that we see. And so, and you talked as well about how there were, how all that industry of effort to sort of to shape that land over thousands of years you know i don't think mm. we let go of it sort of quite so easily do we but uh yeah if we can if we can find the right kind of spaces and things to enhance what we've got that that's definitely feels feels the way to do it yeah i've, I've got yeah. another 
I've got another question just come in here. Let's see what it says. Uh, Nigel says, uh, uh, well done on finding a niche market for your wool and meat, but do you think that the scope, uh, the, the scope for the majority of Dartmoor farmers to do something similar? So yeah, is it, is it something um, viable for everyone? Um, possibly, I, I suppose, you know, we've got niche sheep, but we're not very productive. More Other people are more productive in terms of they got past the growing sheep. But I think there is still there's, there is an appetite for eating locally, and I suppose getting that message across, you know, eating the landscape um, helps in sort of you know less but better quality. Um, but in terms of I think even as farmers, we can't compete with mass-produced food. You know, even in down in South Devon, you know, the grass grows that much quicker when it does up here. So they've got that natural advantage. Um, so the only way, you know, it almost feels like you're on a hiding nothing to try and produce and compete with that, let alone the Australians and New Zealanders, um, that sort of input in terms of commodity pricing. Um, yeah. So it, it's difficult. It's good. It's a bit like the, sort of the, you know, we talked about net being such a fantastic model for rewilding, you know, and they've got really niche markets of their meat. Um, yeah. But if you had 100 or 1,000 nets, then you say that market would be a lot less. Um, you know, it's certainly one reason why we're moving to transition to organic is that we can sort of hit the more mainstream. Nobody's selling you know, certainly a cattle through to Riverford and people like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, I mean, I think sort of if if um, if you're passionate about wildlife, then I think you need to think a bit more about where your food comes from and actually what impact yeah. it has on on the landscape so yeah so i think that move to organic that could definitely sort of help people feel that they were they were helping to look after it rather than having to put lots of you know if you're a more industrial i don't want to say yeah, yeah you know a more intensive farmer in more intensive yeah then then you're probably applying more inputs to the land in order to get slightly better yields out of it and that has an impact on the on the wildlife, doesn't it? They don't have those margins and uh, yeah. bugs and critters and weeds in the meadows. There. Yeah. Um, apologise. Which I think at the moment, yeah, Dartmoor farmers, I think it's got a bit of sort of carrot and stick in terms of you know, the carrot of being the somebody who's been out there for doing delivering public goods, but the stick is the, l the lack of the BPS payment in terms of you making more, more. You know that graph I showed earlier on in terms of the agricultural production the average hill farm, they make a loss on their sheep and cattle. Um, so the answer of, of keeping more of them isn't going to make you more money. If, you know, if anything, you may lose more money as well as having to work harder. So I think people will be naturally stepping back and looking at other forms of income. You know, for us, um, something I didn't mention in terms of the animals, you know, much reason for selling direct is so we keep control of the animals um they don't go to market and we don't lose track of where they're going to go um we just know that you know their one journey out of here is down to ashburton um so it's that come back to that animal welfare sort of thing because they don't make a lot of money then you know if we work really hard and work them really hard you know we make you know we possibly make twice as much money um but it's still Bugger all. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, it's much easier to do less and less and better. Yeah. Excellent. So I, I was, I might have looked slightly distracted just at that moment then, Mark, because like, you went down to a letterbox slot then. So it was like you, okay. you, you slot down again. So I've, I've just been sort of working behind the scenes trying to uh, put you back into some kind of normal size there. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the, apologies for uh, for the technical issues there. Um, I think that's probably all the questions we've got in our in our chat tonight. Um, so I think you must have sort of been uh, very informative in terms of what you said in uh, in answering everyone's questions there. So uh, yeah, there's no more questions in the uh, in the emails. Uh, just to double check. Uh, yeah, I've got two email boxes. Can't see any in there. Uh, and the chat, uh, we've asked all those questions. Uh, so that's that's brilliant. So thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, uh, thank you for giving us a really informed uh, conversation about about farming on Dartmoor and, and actually how it affects uh, uh, 
affects the landscape and uh, and the heritage of the landscape and you know we were talking really about all that thousand year, thousands of years of 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 history there of, of those first farmers actually you've got evidence of those first farmers mm. on there and you're still farming that landscape and you know in 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 similar ways in some ways uh to perhaps how it was done in the past so uh yeah mm. so thank you for that thank you for keeping the traditions alive and uh yeah we've got plenty of opportunities to get out and about haven't we are you still doing um hay meadow walks of those finished now well the hay meadow walks have just finished last weekend because the hay meadow's just going over now um but as I say we do walks all year round with sort of groups of anybody who sort of comes to the says i've got a group of from the rspb or wildlife yeah. trust or you know even if we've got a yoga group coming next week um <laughs> So just have, always happy to show people around, and it's always good to get other people's ideas of what could be done differently. There's so many expertise out there, um, so it's good to get yeah different viewpoints and as good excuse to go for a walk round. Fabulous, as well, excellent, and yeah. um, and also uh, the, the, this bracken uh, pulling or bashing day is the 25th. Is that the 25th of July? 25th of July at 2:30. Um, all welcome. Um, cream tea afterwards for all the volunteers. But basically, in our best hay meadow, we we've got back. We put, pulled it all last year. We had a load of volunteers, and so it's looking weak. Um, so we want to make it even weaker by pulling it out again. So hopefully, an hour or two with lots of willing hands, yeah, um, we'll have it have a feel clear again. Excellent. Um, uh, do you want uh, do you want people to get in touch with you about that, or just turn up on the day, or? Um, it's it's on we put on our Facebook as an event, but people it, basically people turn up. I'm not I'm not well enough organised to um, <laughs> think we'll put signs up and then you know if, if 100 people turn up, we'll have it done in 20 minutes. So, but we might might run out of scones or anything. <laughs> Excellent. So get there early. I think is the uh, is yeah. the uh, tip there. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, so everyone can do a bit of practical conservation work and uh, have a nice cream cream tea and um, yeah, and browse some of the uh, the organic uh, uh, meat as well, I guess, uh, and sheepskins yeah, and things. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a one-stop yeah. shop, bro. It's a one-stop day out. You can do some conservation. You can have a cream tea yeah. and you can support uh, the Dartmoor farmers as well. So brilliant. Okay. Excellent. Thank okay. And you for that advertisement. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So. so commercial uh, breaks over at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know because it was really subtle up to that point, wasn't it? Uh, so yeah, I apologise yeah. for bringing it out so uh, ostentatiously there. Uh, yeah. So just to remind everybody uh, that there are three more talks uh, in in our little heritage festival. So on Thursday we've got Dartmoor and the Black Death. Uh, we've got. Um, uh, we've got uh, Dartmoor and the defence of Dartmoor looking at the military on Dartmoor on the following Tuesday. And then we're looking at the history of Dartmoor through 10 objects. So we're going to look at sort of how archaeologists use objects to to tell the story of the people who lived and worked in that landscape. So that should be fascinating to do. In the meantime, look, keep a, an eye on, on our website because uh, and our social media because there'll be information about uh about other bits of historical and heritage stuff uh that we've uncovered uh so keep an eye on that uh, and also take a look out for uh, suggestions of places that you might want to go so you might want to go and have a an explore over grim's pound uh and then maybe sort of walk back uh looking out at the strip linchets of chalicum uh on a walk maybe at the weekend so uh, lots that you could do. Uh, really good to have so many of you here with us today. Uh, lots of nice comments. Uh, thank you from C. Houston. Thanks for Nigel. Uh, so yeah, lots of people saying lovely things. Uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you and, and good night. And uh, we'll see you all again uh, very soon. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.